Um, we got to baptize a bunch of folks last, last uh, Sunday, and uh, we, it, we've done it two months in a row, and we were part of this thing called Baptize California, and there were about 6,000 people in Huntington Beach baptized last week, and 12,000 in California. Um, yes, 12,000 people got baptized. Over 300 churches participated. It was an amazing event. I just, I really believe God is doing something in California. And I just want to, I hope you're, you're feeling that or you're preparing like we've been talking about. Um, I have something I get to do special today, which I get to commission our new youth pastor. Um, yeah, you, that's decent. That's decent. Um, man, I'm trying to warm you up for our, our preacher today because he, uh, he doesn't need a warm up, but I, I think you should do better than that. Um, uh, commissioning, let me just say this, commissioning. Uh, is not something that's just practical. It's deeply spiritual. And one of the things I realized, having ministered now for lots of years, uh, most of the people, most of us actually need to be reminded w what we're doing here, that this isn't just an event. We don't consume Christianity, but we are part of a body. We are part of a, a sacred processional that's been going on for thousands of years, stewarding the, the things that Jesus has done on the cross for the world. And as being a part of his body, um, we see that there are instructions for how to govern and lead the church. And so this is a moment we're going to pray, we're going to ask God to anoint, and we're going to set someone into a position. Now, for those of you that don't know, we had a youth pastor. She was amazing. Her name was Amy. Do you guys remember Pastor Amy? Yeah. Let's go. And uh, she felt called to take on this new position for Young Life in, as the area director of Long Beach. And we were so heartbroken for her to leave. But we knew God was calling us to find a new youth pastor. And that process was long. And I, I want you to know this as I'm trying to help you see, we're not trying to fill positions here. We, don't, we obviously, we've grown a lot in the last year. And we don't try to fill positions. We try to acknowledge um, where God is calling us to put people into roles that they're, they're called to, they're, they're anointed for, um, and we uh, ordain, we appoint or recognize their spiritual authority or the grace on their life as leaders of the church. This is all very biblical. I know I'm trying to teach a lot of theology in a moment, but I want you to see that this is a sacred moment for our church to recognize that God has brought a new youth pastor for us. And when we were interviewing, and it took months to find the right person, and we find, found the right person, one of the things that we said is we want to see someone who's committed to taking the current fifth graders all the way to graduation, um, that we want them to build a culture uh, of the things that we're seeing on Sunday in our house churches within the youth. And I actually have to say that what youth is, what's happening in our youth is actually leading the way. Um, they, they really are. Our youth is experiencing something amazing. And so with all of that, I want to tell you what's going to happen. So Paul says in Titus, if you want to pull out your Bibles, let me just see if those of you that actually brought real Bibles. I know some of you brought your idols in your pocket, but some of you brought your Bibles. I know I beat up the phone, but, you know, someone's got to do it. You're like, someone said to me that they felt shame, so they brought their Bible. And I said, you mistook shame with conviction from the Holy Spirit. Know the difference, brother. Um, Paul says in, first, uh, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he says, the reason, I love hearing the pages. Go ahead, Titus. I'll t you take your time. I'll give you grace. Some of you are like, Google Titus. Some of you know exactly where Titus is. It's in the New Testament, right? If you're in Acts, turn right. If you get to Revelation, go back left. Verse 5, I just want you to see this. He's writing to a young leader. He says, it's a short verse. The reason I left you in Crete was that, uh, was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So he, he writes to this leader. He says, the reason I left you was to appoint shepherd, leaders, elders. That's the word elder, shepherd, pastor in the towns that I left you in. And there's something about the, the role of a leader within the church that is required to be appointed, commissioned, ordained into that uh, is left Paul saying it's not finished yet. That there's something sacred about making sure that there's leadership in place, not over just local churches, but over cities. Isn't that interesting? That's a whole theology I don't have time to get into. But for Paul, the spiritual authority of a local church is key to accomplishing its mission. 
right? How the church is led or governed has implications of its effectiveness of its mission within the city it's called to or the region. Spiritual authority of the church in the city is connected to the work of God for the city. God throughout history has used ordinary people as his primary vehicle of establishing his mission on earth. If you read Genesis, it's Adam and uh, Eve, it's Noah, it's Abraham. If you go all the way through the New Testament, it's the disciples who are radically ordinary. And for the rest of eternity, he's going to be using ordinary people like you and I to continue his mission. Are you with me on this? So just a little theology of commissioning. So the task for us is to recognize that this position that we're filling um, has spiritual weight to it. Does that make sense? That's all I want you to see. Can you guys welcome Slav and Sydney? Slav is our new youth pastor. Come on up. Oh, yeah, you go here. We're so glad you're here. We did this in the first service, but you get to hear it fresh. Um, we're going to pray for them in just a moment. But um, this is Slav. This is his wife, Sydney. They are, he, he is on staff, and he is our new youth pastor. Would you just give us a little bit of a glimpse of your heart? What are you excited about being here on staff at the Garden for the youth? What's in your heart? What can we pray for? All of those things. Thank you, Pastor Darren. Yeah, it is an honor and privilege to be a part of the family and join in what God is already doing. Um, as you guys know, there are so many testimonies and stories of what the Spirit is doing and filling in the, in the lives of the students. And I just want to say to the students who are up here and also through, throughout the entire um, audience that Jesus has an amazing plan for you these next couple years. We're just thrilled to join in in what he's already doing and just pray for us that we encounter more of the spirit, that we encounter more of him, that students fall in love with Jesus more and more, that I fall in love with Jesus more and more every day, um, and that we will be able to tell stories uh, decades from now of what he did through uh, Garden Youth. So, Yeah. So good. Just to add, I'm here today because of mentors who stepped in the gap for me when I was their age. And I know many of you have testimonies that are the same. So please just pray again for just anointing that the Lord would break our hearts for this generation. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for prayers for our marriage. And um, yeah, we're just so expectant and excited. So thank you. I love it. So we're going to pray for them. But I did this in the first. I want you to hear it again. And it's a little... Uh, an edited piece of uh, work I've got on spiritual authority. I think you should all hear. It's good for all of us, but I, I'm saying this to Slav. It's from Rob Reimer's book, um, Spiritual Authority. He says, good leadership competencies are necessary. They are important, but without the development of spiritual authority, they are not enough to accomplish what only God can accomplish. You can grow a church or a youth ministry, but we won't change the spiritual atmosphere of a region you could run effective programs, but you won't be able to cast out demons or heal the sick or change a condition of the human heart without authority. If you want to touch heaven to change earth, you must learn spiritual authority. Moving mountains is more about authority than human leadership, competency, and capacity. So I encourage you uh, to move mountains, and that's what I want to see. So would you, get, would you guys come down here? Can I have our staff elders, if you're here, uh, Riverhouse staff that's here, friends, parents that have youth, if you want to come up, we're going to lay hands and pray. If you feel compelled based on what I said, you can stand up and come lay hands. Otherwise, sit there with your hand extended as just a symbol that you're going to pray with us. I encourage you to pray with us. Let's just bless this couple. Uh, as, I, as we pray, I'm just grateful, Lord, that you send laborers into the harvest, but I'm also reminded of the urgency needed for the next generation. And we ask, Lord, that you would anoint Slav and Sid for the ministry they have here, but also beyond here. We ask, Holy Spirit, you would keep their hearts protected against the attack from the enemy, protect their marriage, their future family. We pray for an anointing of your spirit to preach the word of God, to proclaim truth, to be anchored in truth, to speak from a place of revelation and intimacy. We ask for power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to do the works of Jesus in ordinary ways. And I pray you'd awaken a revival and reformation of the next generation through them. And we pray this we, uh, in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, give it up for these guys. Thank you so much. All right. Eleven, how are we doing? Are we here? Oh, wow, man. I'm not
not so sure. You know, I'll feel it out. Well, after, so I have a friend here. He is the lead pastor of Riverhouse in Boise, Idaho. Um, there's a bunch of their staff here. We're so glad they're here. They have uh, an amazing church in Boise, and God is doing extraordinary things through their community. Uh, pastor Jordan and I became friends a little over a year ago, about a year and a half ago, and uh, in the world I'm in, it's really special to find friends who have what he has, um, and that would be the first and foremost a pure heart. And I know it's hard to, it's sad to say in the church world uh, when it comes to leadership that that's a rare thing in leadership. It is a rare thing in leadership. And so when you find it, you hold on to it for dear life. And so uh, Pastor Jordan and his wife Jackie are here, and they have been leading for many years. He's planted church eight years ago, and they are seeing signs and wonders. They're seeing a massive growth. They're seeing favor and generosity. Um, and they carry something as a community. And I know some of you are new to our church, but one of the things that we've been working hard for many years as a community is steward the gifts God's, God brings us. And Jesus talks about this. He talks about in the Gospels that the way the kingdom works is through honor. And honor, I know it gets tricky with this, with the idea of spiritual authority and all that stuff, but honor is re recognizing that someone is here that carries more than just a good teaching gift. And so when I bring people, I'm not bringing guest preachers. I'm bringing people that carry something that I hope we receive. And so I want to invite you right now. I didn't do this in the first service, but I'm going to pray for you to receive what Jordan's carrying. So would you just open your hands? In a world where we can consume content, would you receive the word from the Lord today? I pray your heart would be open and prepared. If you didn't prepare it already, in the name of Jesus, prepare it. May the Holy Spirit speak to you through what's been built in a hidden place with God for many years. May you open yourself to the Jesus uh, that is alive and well in, in this gathering. And would you be good soil that the word of God would build a hundredfold ministry as a result of one word. Jesus, would you give us uh, the grace this morning of greater revelation from your word uh, through Jordan? I bless Jordan as he preaches in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you welcome my friend, Pastor Jordan Vernon? Good morning, Garden Church. I, uh, I, I feel like I know you guys vicariously through Darren. I've got to spend quite a bit of time with Darren the last year and a half, but it feels good to be. I've been to six o'clock before. It was my first time with the full garden experience. So uh, I feel like Darren, I found a big brother. And Darren, we have a, a lot of similarities uh, in our stories, even in our churches. And honestly, it feels strangely like being home. So uh, I don't know if you'll feel at home with me, but I feel at home with you. So I'm going to make myself at home. And I'm going to have a good time up here, whether you like it or not. No, I'm, I'm teasing. Uh, I'm going to pray, and then we'll get into God's word together. Amen? Amen. Yeah, we, we just acknowledge that you are here, Jesus. And we thank you for the supreme privilege of getting to be in your manifest presence. Lord, we treasure these moments in our hearts. And Lord, from this place of gratitude, we ask for more. And we say more, God. Would you enlarge our hearts that we would know you more? Would you increase our capacity to know you and to be known by you? And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you give us courage today to open our hearts further, to yield more deeply, to abandon ourselves more completely to you, Jesus that we would somehow, by a work of your spirit, find your heart formed in us in a way that it wasn't when we walked through these doors. And we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm going to start, start with a story that kind of frames. It's, it's really where this message kind of birthed from. And it was about a year and a half ago, I was taking a group of guys. We were doing like a, like a scripture shred. We were going to read the Bible four times in one year. And... So we were, you know, you got to read like big chunks of scripture at a time. And I was reading through uh, Chronicles and Kings. And, you know, it's kind of like a biblical rendition of Another One Bites the Dust. And it's just 
this king failed, this king failed, this king failed. It's kind of a depressing day when you're, you know, on that storyline. And anyways, I'm in my study, I'm reading, and all of a sudden I get to the point where it's Josiah and Josiah's pure heart that does righteousness in the sight of God. And I just get overcome. I just start weeping aloud in my study. And out of me, I just start praying like, oh God, where is the purity? God, where is the humility of heart? God, like, it's as if this a thirst awakened in me. And as I pondered and reflected on what was taking place in me, I just, I just became aware that we are living in a cultural moment where I think there is a thirst in the church, but in culture for a heart that can truly be trusted, for a heart that's, that's truly pure, for a heart that's truly humble. The world is thirsting for the heart of Jesus. And the world doesn't know how to define it, but the church should. And, and I think that we are in this, this moment. There is an opportunity for us as the people of God, not just to define and understand and get a revelation of the heart of Jesus and the purity of his heart, but actually become that living definition where we allow the spirit of God to so form and transform us on the inside that we become that type of heart that could perhaps offer a cup of cold water to a culture thirsting for purity. So, so I want to talk today about thirsting for purity. Perhaps let the Spirit take us on a journey to open our eyes more further to see into the heart of Jesus and then be wooed to open our hearts in response to allow the Spirit access to places that maybe we haven't given him access before. Are you with me? Yeah. I don't have a ton of notes on the screen that's so why I tell, I tell my church a lot back home, it's a good thing that we record these things, you know, you can listen to it again. So I just want you to, to open your heart. So I'm, I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey. I'm going to start with the mind and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of tunnel down into our hearts today. And by the, the grace of the Spirit, I believe he's going to speak to us. So, so I want to contextualize this, uh, in, in this, this journey to kind of see what the scripture shows us about Jesus' heart. And I want to kind of zoom back to the book of Deuteronomy. Have you read the book of Deuteronomy? Five of you have read the book of Deuteronomy. The rest of you should read the book of Deuteronomy. It's a great book. The word Deuteronomy just means to give the law again. So this is the fifth book of the Bible. The first five books are called the Torah. And the fifth book is to give the law again. And you could say, well, why is Moses giving the law again? He's giving the law again because the people that he gave the law to the first time are dead. So they were hard-hearted. They died in the wilderness. A new generation has risen up. They are getting ready. They're poised to cross the Jordan River, step into the promised land. And Moses, this is the end of his life, the end of his ministry. He's giving his swan song. And he's saying, I'm going to give the law again. And he is prophesying the law. He's prophesying Torah to this new generation poised to step into the promised land because he is yearning that they would be successful in living out and seeing the fulfillment of God's promises as they enter into the promise for generation after generation after generation as they inhabit the land. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, so the first 11 chapters of Deuteronomy, scholars would call this the heart section. Like if, you, if you just, you, you should do this. You should read the first 11 chapters and just look for all the references to heart. It's just again and again and again, Moses is speaking to the heart. He's saying, guard your heart, keep your heart, watch your heart. Here's, here's just a couple verses. I think we have them on the screen. This is Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy 8, verse 2. I like to hear the sound of those pages. Good job, Darren. Discipling them well in this house. But uh, I saw Darren on his phone in first service, so... I'm like, I'm the little brother. I can tell on him. You know what I mean? <laughs> Busted. Deuteronomy 8, 2. And you shall remember the Lord your God led you all these 40 years in the wilderness. Why? To humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. God is, is he is after the heart. 
He cares deeply about your heart. And Moses, the, the end of his life, his legacy, he's like, keep your heart pure. Keep your hearts clean. Let them be kept with reverence for the Lord, with holiness and obedience. And if we were to kind of summarize it down, if we were going to get a succinct summary of the heart that God is looking for, it's two things. It's the great commandment. It's a heart of loyal love to God. Like Abraham, who was loyal to God in a land full of idols. God is looking for peoples whose hearts would be loyal to him amidst all the cultural gods that are vying and fighting and warring for your worship. God is looking for loyalty. And then a heart that is bent in love towards other people to serve and lift up all people, but especially the marginalized, the poor, the outsider, the hurting. It's a heart of loyalty of God and a heart that lives to serve other people and lift them up. That is the heart that God's looking for. Israel crosses the Jordan into the promised land, and then you can play the music because another one bites the dust. And it is story after story after story of messianic hopefuls, men and women anointed by the Spirit who fail whose hearts give in to Adam's corruption of sin and death. No one can overcome the curse of sin. They break loyalty with God, and their hearts turn away from people. They begin to uh, become puffed up with their own self-importance, their own self-glory, their own self-serving, and it's just story after story after story. Is it David? No. Is it Solomon? No. And the Old Testament is written in such a way that when it closes, you are thirsty. You're thirsty for the heart that Moses is prophesying of in Deuteronomy. You're thirsting. Where is the heart of purity? Where is the one who will actually demonstrate and embody this heart of loyalty to God and true love for people? Oh, everybody says they're about serving people. But when everything's exposed and you're naked before God, what are the motives of your heart? Yeah. Where is that heart? Where's the purity? Yeah. So we turn to the New Testament and Jesus of Nazareth shows up. He comes to the river. He's baptized by John. The Spirit falls on him and anoints him. And at this point, if we were in the story, at this point, Jesus is just another messianic hopeful. Another man anointed by the Spirit, but the same question would remain. Will his heart fail? Will his heart corrupt? What is the nature of his heart? And the first thing that happens post-baptism, post-anointing, is the gospel writers are clear. He is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. Why? Because I lead you to the wilderness to test you to see what's in your heart. It's like, wake up. The gospel writers are like, you want to see? We're going to open the hood. You want to see Jesus? Come, follow me. We see Jesus get tempted three times by Satan, and he responds with three scriptures from which book in the Bible? Deuteronomy, first 11 chapters. It's like, here is the heart of your Messiah. And in the last year, I've become particularly mesmerized with the power temptation. I don't have time to go to all three, though we can do that ourselves. But I want to zoom in. I want to really look at this power temptation. And the first thing I want to say is when we read that Jesus is tempted, he's actually tempted. Sometimes we, we almost get this idea that it's like, well, he's God, you know, so it was like, He's not really that tempted. He's not tempted like when I'm tempted. Like, no, he's tempted. He's a high priest who is tempted in all things as we are, but without sin. Right? And when you're tempted by something, it means you're actually allured by it. It means there's something in you, like desires quickened. Like, you're kind of like lean. There's something about it that, that kind of appeals to you. And I find it kind of fascinating that Jesus is tempted to worship Satan. You're like, oh, Really? You know, because I think we, we get this idea, we get this like super like dark culty type movie scene, like it's like cult worship. I don't think that's how Satan tempts us. 
I don't think the temptation to value and imitate the way of Satan is, is quite as dark and culty as we think. I think it actually comes to us in ways that seem much more appealing than we would at, at first glance think. Yeah. Right? And if we're just kind of simplify it, it's because what Satan is tempting Jesus with is an easy way. Right. Say easy way. easy way. That's the way of say It's an easy way. This is the way of the world. It's an easy way. Jesus' way is hard. It's an easy yoke, but it's a hard way. So it's an easy way versus a hard way. And as I, I'll just kind of tease this out a bit. You know, what, what is Jesus being tempted? What's the bait? Saying you can have the glory, you can have the power of leadership without the cost of leadership, without the responsibility of leadership, without the cross. You can have it, Jesus. Jesus, Forget the people. Make this about yourself. Make this about you. As I see it, the temptation is to use power to procure privilege and pleasure for yourself instead of using it to lift up other people. This is what the valuing and imitating of the way of the world, the way of Satan looks like. It's using power to procure privilege and pleasure for yourself and forsaking the call, the responsibility to serve and lift up people and specifically the people that could never give anything back in reply to you. Right, there's, there's some subtle but massive shifts that take place when you give in to this temptation, when you, really, when you really ponder the paradigm shifts that are taking place of what Jesus is being tempted. And the first shift, as I see it, is it's a shift from self-emptying to self-glory. It says, you can have the pleasure and the luxury of leadership without the inconvenience of servanthood and the humility of surrender. The implication being you can become so intoxicated by the privileges of this life that you will become numb to the cries of the broken. It's a shift from self-emptying to self-glory. You get blinded by yourself and you can't see past it. You miss your mission. You miss your vocation because you're getting blinded with you. I've heard this sermon. I've been in this church. I've seen this story. And I don't say that with an ounce of judgment or criticism. I say it with mourning in my heart. Second shift is it's a vision of transformation to a vision of celebritization. This one really gets me, you guys. Jesus you will be celebrated and celebratized by the people. Instead of them crucifying you, they will celebrate you. And you'll become so inundated with the sound of their celebration that it will lull you to sleep and you will forget that you lost your ability to bring transformation to them. Because the cross was not Jesus' benefit for himself. It was only benefiting in that it was his means to bring transformation to a dark and dying and sin-filled planet. And he's tempting Jesus. Make it about you. You will become a celebrity, man. You just won't be able to change them. You'll have no authority to enact transformation. Forfeit that. They won't. Be so fired up singing your praise. And it just is marvelous to me that in this secret place of deep temptation, we see the heart of our Lord. He says, give me the cross. I did not come here for me. I did not come here to become a celebrity. I did not come here to be praised by man. I didn't come here to be served. I didn't come here to be honored. I didn't come here to be celebrated. I came here to be loyal to my God no matter what, obedient to the point of death. And I came here to give my life to serve other people that other people can be saved. 
healed, delivered, transformed. This is the heart. This is the heart. This is the heart that God was speaking of in Deuteronomy. And this is the heart that every person on this planet is longing to see, to know, to love, to be known by. It's this heart. Paul captures this in Philippians 2. He captures it a bit more poetically. He says, though Jesus was in himself, he was, he was equal. He had a quality with God. He didn't count it something to be grasped. Say grasped. He, he didn't grasp. He wasn't grasping. He wasn't trying to procure promotion or power or privilege or luxury. He was not trying to grasp for himself, but instead he emptied. Say emptied. This is powerful imagery. This is Eve grasping for the tree. This is Abraham grasping for Hagar. This is David grasping for Bathsheba. This is the picture, the war between the flesh and and the spirit, the Christ identity formed and birthed by the spirit. He didn't grasp. He emptied himself to the point of death. In other words, there was no ask of obedience he was unwilling to say yes to. There was no depth of humility and servanthood he was not willing to, yes, to say yes to. There was, he, he gave everything. And this is our hero. This is our model. This is our aim. This is our Christ. This is our king. Our example. I was 19 years old. And at this point in my life, uh, my brother and I have two little brothers, but my, uh, my middle brother were about two years apart. We had a horrible relationship. Um, and, and in large part, it was because of me. Uh, I was a, an all-state athlete. I was overachiever, accolades, achievements, all of it to, to mask and veil deep, deep, deep insecurity. And there's a lot of pain that we didn't know how we were dealing with, but my brother was struggled with weight, deeply insecure, and I was a huge part of it. I was a bully. I was mean. I was critical. And we had a very painful relationship. And... God had begun to do this, this awakening in my family through the midst of a lot of suffering. The Spirit of God and His grace was faithful to the prayers of my mother, and, and He began to do a work in the midst of the ash heap and the pain and the tragedy and the trauma that we were walking through. And in the midst of this, I, I had moved to California. I was back home. My mom said, I just want us to pray in the morning. And so we're praying, my mom and my brothers and I, and we're praying. And as we're praying, I hear this voice. And the voice says, go get a basin of water, wash your brother's feet, and tell him you'll live to serve him and make him greater than you. And I immediately said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and Jesus said, it's me. You going to obey me or not? And I had enough fear of the Lord in that moment that I sat there for probably five minutes. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, seriously? Like, there was nowhere to run. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Woo! So I, I obeyed. I got the water. I knelt down. I began to wash my brother's feet. Never done anything like this in my life. And as I went to start saying those words, I'll live to serve you and make you greater than myself, it, it, was, it was like nails on a chalkboard in my soul. It was a battle in me. Like, it was uncomfortable. I was like, what are you saying? I, was, I wanted the words back, but I knew it was this covenantal moment. I knew I was saying it before God and before witnesses, and it was real. You know, obedience doesn't always feel good, but it creates good. 
And over the coming years of my life, the Lord began leading me deeper and deeper into the wilderness, deeper and deeper into obscurity, stripping away the accolades and the accomplishments and the identities and the titles that I had taken upon myself, exposing me to the deep insecurities that I was masking with all of the bright lights and the bright facades. And at the same time that I'm walking through the stripping, my brother is walking through an exalting. God begins to use him. He begins to see miracles, seeing deaf ears open, starts preaching the gospel. He starts, like his life is being transformed. And you know what my response would be? I'd get insecure and threatened. I'd want to, I'd want to pull away in my heart. And that same voice would keep coming to me. Are you going to live to serve him? Are you going to rejoice in his exaltation? Are you going to bless him? Are you going to praise him? Are you going to, are you going to serve him? And there's many times humiliating for me. I'd have to go and repent. I've closed my heart towards you because I'm insecure. So humbling. Have to look at yourself and be like, what is wrong with me? Years of this, it was, it was a painful process and I had to do it by discipline. Then there was this day, I, 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 my beginnings in ministry were very obscure. I preached in a back room of a denominational church in my hometown with five people. If you've ever preached a full sermon to five people, it's an uncomfortable experience. <laughs> You're like, I got a full meal cooked. Do I give you the whole meal? <laughs> it's just only so much passion you can speak with. <laughs> and it's just right here. It was hard. It was hard. I remember one of these nights I'd just finished preaching and I went, I went to my office. My brother called me and he just had got this massive promotion. He was going to start, he'd be weekly speaking in front of like 1,000 to 1,500 people. And God, God was just exalting him. He's amazing. If you know him, he's amazing. So anointed. And it was the first time when he called me, he told me those words. My heart leapt inside me. Like it just leapt, it rejoiced. And I hung up the phone, I just started crying. I was like, oh my gosh, you are doing something in me. You are changing my heart from the inside. Uh, in, in the same season, this, these really obscure uh, years, uh, I had a, 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 an amazing moment in my life where a, a woman named Heidi Baker I, I came into contact with, and some of you may know her, some of you may not, it doesn't matter, but uh, she came, she prophesied um, some of the most, it was one of the most significant moments of my life. Prophetic promises. She said, you know, I see you, you're going to preach to hundreds of thousands of people. I see you traveling the world. I know this call. It is my call. You're going to have a church one day. It was, it was very significant, um, which a lot of it has now come to pass in my life. But I, I, I'm stewarding this word in the midst of a, a, a such obscure season of my life. And I used to go to the church uh, at, at late at night when no one was there. And I would pray in an empty room. I used to preach to an empty room. And he would say, I want you to see, I want you to cling to my promise with a white knuckle grip. You know, at first I was like, well, I got to go make this promise happen, you know? And the Lord said, whoa, 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 buddy. Whoa, buddy. That's not your job. So your job is to take care on the inside. Your job is to follow me and let me form Christ in your heart, that your heart will become like the heart of Jesus. He said, and if you steward the inside, I'll take care of the outside. He said, if you will just walk in faithfulness and let me transform and sanctify you, I will do the things out there. He said, because they're beyond you. They're impossible. You can't make those things happen. So I said, yes, Lord. And I stewarded it and I fought for it. And there were many nights he said, close your eyes and see the fulfillment of the promises that I've spoken to your life and praise me for them now. There, there was holy moments where I clung and I fought the fight of faith to see the promise come from, from inception into fruition. And, and I don't have time to go into the depth of it, but it was about a 10-year journey. And about a year and a half ago, I found myself in a hotel room in a foreign nation the night before I was going to stand and preach to about 110,000 people. And I was going to see the, the fulfillment, the first fruits of this promise that I'd stewarded for a decade. And I'm laying in bed, and across from the room, my brother's in his bed, and I hear this whisper from the Holy Spirit. He says, I want you to give it away. I want you to give it to your brother. And all I felt was joy. 
I've shared, this, I've shared this story with some people, and they say, I don't like that story. <laughs> They're like, is God sick? <laughs> that was your promise. That was your fight. That was your story. That was your moment. I'm like, no. God's vision of greatness is not the vision of the world. So God is not sick. He is authoring greatness in line with the master. And I just want to bring to our attention this morning, brothers and sisters, that there are two competing visions of greatness in our world. And much of the church is asleep and living in a fog, thinking that these two visions can cohabitate. They cannot. They are diametrically opposed. There is the way of Jesus, which is the way of the cross. And there is the way of the world, which is energized by Satan. Use power to procure privilege, to procure a platform to procure luxury, to procure you. It's your right. You're entitled to it. You worked for this. This is what culture preaches. And there's a subtle drift into compromise. And those who start in purity find themselves twisted on the inside. Because we think that the vision of Jesus, the way of the cross and the way of the world, the greatness of the world and the greatness of Jesus, we think we can have both of it. Both and. No, 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 it's not both and. It's either or. A.W. Tozer says every man's heart, every woman's heart, there is a cross and there is a throne. You take your seat and Christ takes the other. And there are too many in the church today that are competing with Jesus to sit on the throne of their lives. We are confessing superficially that Jesus is Lord. But we are chasing and competing with culture to keep up with the vision of greatness that the world says. Oh, it's platform, it's power, it's luxury, it's following. This is not Jesus. You know, Jesus, Jesus is compelled by absolute loyalty to God and an ethic of self-surrendering, surrendering, self-emptying love. He lives to lift up other people, to lift up the hurting, the broken, the marginalized. That's what he's about. Yeah. Right. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is quoted as saying that when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. This is the heart of Jesus' message. There is no such thing as Christianity without the cross. He bids a man come and die. Come and die that you can find new life. This is what's crazy about this. This is what's sobering about this. Right? Like we, we, we can choose the way of Jesus. We can choose the way of the world. And it's a really serious decision. It has huge implications. Robert Frost, anybody? A road diverged in the wood, and I, I chose the one less traveled by, and it made all the difference. We have a choice to make living in this cultural moment where there is a, a, a devastating scarcity of purity, not just in the world, in the church. We have a choice to make while we choose the road less traveled by. Right? And when Jesus calls us to the cross, when he calls us to come and die, he's either speaking as a lunatic. Like he's either crazy. He, his vision of leadership and greatness is either ludicrous. And if it's ludicrous, don't listen to him and reject everything he has to say. Or he's speaking as a liar. He could be lying. He could be deceiving. He could be trying to dupe us and like tricking us into some self-deprecating vision. So he wants to steal our joy and steal our purpose and steal our significance. So he's speaking as a lunatic. He's speaking a liar. Or he's speaking as the Lord of life. Who's saying, I alone know the true way of life. 
I alone am the author of the cosmos, of the creation. I alone know the way of wisdom. I alone know the path of human flourishing, the way, the, 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 the path that leads to true significance, to true purpose, to a life that God says, that was a great life. This is my aim. I am convicted. I am convicted in those who profess the name of the Lord. It makes no sense to be anything less than convicted of the way of Jesus. If we confess him as Lord, then let's follow him as Lord. I mean, it was one of the darkest times of my whole life. I was being tempted in so many ways because I was in so much pain. And he kept saying, come and die. Come and die with me, Jordan. I said, I don't want to. I was in college, everybody else was medicating away with all the pleasures of the world, and I wanted to go that path so bad. So I was in so much pain, my world was falling apart, my family was falling apart, I was suffering, I'd been seeking him, the pain had just got worse. What do you mean? I thought the gospel was, come and follow Jesus and he makes everything happy. No, no, that's cheap. The only things that are valuable cost everything. And Jesus wants to give you a life of value not some sort of cheap message of cheap grace that only requires a cheap surrender. He wants to fulfill this deep yearning inside of you to live a life of greatness. And I was wrestling with God. I remember the place I was. I was in Southern California. I was looking out over the ocean. It was late in the night. And I said, God, I am so tempted right now. I bid you come and die. And I looked at him. I just looked up. I don't know how I know I looked at him, but I looked at him in the eye. I said, here's the deal. I said, I'm going to say yes to you. I said, but this is what I want you to promise me. I said that on the day I die, I can do it breathing my last breath saying that was a life well lived. I said, if you promise me that I will live a life of meaning and significance, I will go anywhere you ask me. I'll give you the yes. I'll give you the whole yes. And I covenanted myself to God, and it's been a harder yes than I knew I would have been able to pay. I did not know I had it in me to say yes to what he has asked for, but the Spirit of God has continued to give me the strength to keep saying yes, to keep saying yes, to die daily. That is the call of the Christian. This is not my story. This is our story, because Christ has not just called me. He is calling you. And maybe some of you have been blind to this call. You've been numb to this call. You've been, you've, been, you've been so full of so many competing narratives, you don't even realize that you haven't had ears to hear the voice of Jesus saying, come and follow me. Come and take the cross. Well, hear him calling today. Hear him knocking today. Hear him wooing you today. He has nothing in his heart but supreme kindness and the desire to, to unleash you into the vision of flourishing that he has for your life, into the, 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 the reason for which he created you. I'm really off my notes right now, but I sense... I sense the Spirit of God in this room sobering us. Some of you are sobering right now to the call of Jesus. Some of you are sobering to the competition in your own heart between the throne and the cross. Some of you are, you don't even know what's taking place, but there's something taking place. There's a, a consecration of the Lord that this pure heart of Jesus is being revealed to you in such a way that you're like, I am not who I'm supposed to be right now. I am not who I was. I'm, there, there is something in my heart that is reaching out. I just, I just feel the hunger in this room and I just want to create space to just, to just respond to the Holy Spirit. My story began in a moment much like this. It was like 15, 16 years ago. I'm in my bedroom, and the Spirit of God, He came and He sobered me. I, I, was I, I, I had this vision. I thought I was living the Christian life. I was moral. I was in the church. 
but I was buying into the cultural vision of greatness. I was just hook, line, and sinker sold on a life of power, privilege, luxury in the name of Jesus. And as the Spirit of God came, it was like, it was like my eyes opened and the facade was pulled away. And I saw the emptiness and the selfishness inherent in everything that I was hoping in. And I had no idea of an alternate route, but I just began to proclaim with a loud voice, God, please do not let me walk down that path. Please don't let me live that life. And I cried out, I surrender. I just began saying, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. I, I, my mother had a prayer chapel in our house, and I, I walked into that prayer chapel, and I, I got a permanent marker, and I wrote on the wall, and I said, I surrender my life to you today and forever. It was April 18th, I think it was 2008. And I, the, the, the image that came, I knew it was as if I was signing my life, my name, on the bottom of a blank contract. So you fill it in. You can fill it in. It terrified me. It cost me my dreams. It cost me things I didn't want to lose. But I said, I, I'm going to give you a yes because of a sobering moment where the Spirit of God invited me to say yes to Jesus. And I just sense that there is something of this nature taking place in some of our hearts right now. I just want to invite you to close your eyes. I just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're moving in power right now. Lord, that you are stirring upon hearts right now with the sobriety of your holiness, Lord, with the reverence of your presence. Lord, that you are, you, are, you are doing a work. You are reaching into the heart tonight. Your word says that God is searching to and fro for a heart that is fully devoted to me. And I just sense that right now there's, there's, there's a shift. And if you want to respond to the Holy Spirit, I want you to stand right now. Just stand. It's just telling Jesus there is something. I'm saying yes to you. I'm, I'm yielding to you. I'm opening to you. I just believe there's something. I, I, I sense it's like the fire of the Lord, which to me, the fire of the Lord, it's just the substance of Jesus' purity. It's that pure holy substance of his heart that, that, that you would even ask right now, ask that the fire of God's heart, his, his all-consuming love would touch your heart. If you want to respond to Jesus, if you're standing, I just want to invite you to come forward. Come to the altar. The altar is a place of consecration where we place ourselves upon the altar and say, God, would you come and sanctify me? We can't change our own hearts. We cannot consecrate ourselves. We cannot make ourselves holy, but we can open our hearts that the piercing rays of God's conviction and God's love by His Spirit can do a work that can only be described as miraculous. We just say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for these hearts, Lord, that are bent towards you. Just, just, just tell him, just tell him I'm open. I open my heart. I open my heart. I open my life. I open my relationships. I open my, my job. I, I open, just, just open everything you know how to open. And we just say, Holy Spirit, would you come and speak? Would you come and, and heal? Would you come and transform? Just put surrender on your lips. Try to, to externalize through words to Jesus what's taking place in the secret place of your own hearts right now. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come, Holy Spirit. Come with power right now. Lord, with the power of your holiness. Lord, with the purity of your fire. Come right now. Spirit of God, come and consecrate. Lord, come and consecrate. Lord, let these be burning ones. Lord, let these be devoted hearts. Come and consecrate right, right to the depth, right to the depth, right to the inward places. Just come, Spirit of God, come and consume. Lord, you say that we are your treasured possessions. Lord, come and take residence in these ones that are your treasured 
possessions. Consume, 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 Holy Spirit. 